The week of my first anniversary of living in Florida was greeted by back-to-back -back hurricanes. I live now between uh, Fort Lauderdale to the south and Cape Canaveral to the north on the Atlantic coast of Florida. While Helene caused massive damage in the northern parts of Florida and as far north as North Carolina, it was nothing but pretty normal Florida rain showers for me. But Milton was another matter. Living through a hurricane is kind of like uh, fear from, from being run over by a charging herd of turtles. You know for a week in advance that it's coming, it's coming, it's coming. And the news media, dependent always on fear and anger to attract their viewers, catastrophizes hurricanes to give everyone the impression that there will be no homes and maybe not even any sod left when the hurricane has passed by. For me, even though Milton passed right over us, even Milton was pretty much a non-event. I have a home that was built to resist hurricanes with even hurricane-proof windows and roofing. I keep my trees trimmed and thinned to avoid having the threat from falling trees or falling limbs. My neighborhood maintains uh, storm sewers. There's a retention lake across the street. We have buried utilities. And I'm far enough away and high enough above sea level to not worry about storm surge. In short, I survived the hurricane that did kill many of my neighbors, destroyed homes, tore off roofs, closed businesses, and knocked electrical service out to more than 3 million people in Florida. And I survived it comfortably in an insured middle-class home. Now, I've done relief work in New Orleans uh, with teams of church volunteers. I went more than eight times uh, with, with teams of, of workers to help respond to the destruction of Hurricane Katrina. I've seen what hurricanes can do. I've also lived most of my life in the Midwest. I've seen firsthand that a direct hit from a tornado can not only tear down the strongest of houses, it can even tear down a modern hospital. But the building codes developed in Florida following previous disasters can and do work. People may hate regulations of, biz, of building codes and the requirements of even the nail patterns you have to use for putting shingles on a house, but these things do make a difference. Florida's removal of the words climate change or global warming from school textbooks, that, however, has not proven to be helpful at all. J.D. Vance says that he doesn't want to discuss controversial science, but in spite of controversy created only by climate deniers or people who just don't understand science, government regulation aimed at ameliorating the degree of effect of global climate change or global warming can make a positive difference. The conservative government of North Carolina is to blame for much of the loss experienced in the torrential rains dropped by Hurricane Helene in the mountains, particularly in the Asheville area. The state legislature has repeatedly rejected legislation to limit construction on steep mountainsides or to require homes to be built at least a foot above anticipated flood levels. For the ha first half of my career in ministry for more than 20 years, I tried to avoid making any partisan comments in sermons, and if circumstances seemed to make it necessary to be critical of one party or the other, I always tried to balance that criticism with something negative about the other party so that I could claim to uh, be somehow above the political partisan fray. I've never had a political sign in my yard during those years. I never put a political bumper sticker on my car. But folks, times have changed. I was critical of the way that the Bush administration handled FEMA's response to Hurricane Katrina because there were a lot of politically motivated bad decisions being made. But we did learn a lot about the changing weather of this century from Hurricane Katrina relief. 
We've done better since then in many ways, but still we have two political parties, one of which may occasionally be guilty of exaggeration and one that is regularly guilty of wholesale denial of reality. And as we have most recently experienced in the lies and conspiracy theories espoused by Trump and Vance regarding FEMA's response to Helene, we cannot avoid saying that the Democratic Party seems to generally strive to provide meaningful leadership and meaningful help and the Republican Party seems determined to make matters worse, cause more human suffering and death, and to make the worst of economic decisions. What is it that makes climate change politically controversial? Why would anyone be so determined to deny obvious impacts of a warming earth, seen especially in Earthquakes caused by fracking, stronger hurricanes and tornadoes caused by greenhouse gases, and water scarcity caused by deregulation and poor water management. This quote is broadly attributed to the fiction writer Kurt Vonnegut, though I'll confess that I simply cannot find the source. But he is reported to have said that we'll go down in history as the first society that wouldn't save itself because it wasn't cost effective. Coal, oil, gas interest don't want us to move towards renewable energy sources because that would undercut their profits. Builders don't want to raise construction costs and labor costs by being forced to meet safer building codes. Developers don't want to have to provide for water retention ponds and drainage when they build new neighborhoods or shopping centers. We all know that electric vehicles are cheaper to build, easier to maintain, and they are, frankly, faster than their gas-powered counterparts. And the evolving self-driving features of EVs make them safer than human-operated cars, no matter how good you may think you are at driving. But we resist the change because so much of the economy, especially in the United States, is tied to gas-burning trucks and cars. And of course, mass transit is more efficient, has less climate impact, and uses up less space than the billions of private cars we depend upon now. But that efficiency strikes at the heart of the profit centers of the automobile industry. High-speed rail passes within blocks of my home more than 30 times a day, but the nearest train station is more than 100 miles away because property developers do not want to allow train traffic to stop in the pricey retirement communities along the Atlantic coast. We could slow the negative effects of climate change through technological advances if decisions were not so commonly made by moneyed interests who do not consider the impact that their decisions have on the poor and the vulnerable, who end up paying the highest percentage of their household income just for automobiles and tires and maintenance and gasoline, and who are the most likely to live in the manufactured or unsafe buildings where people regularly die in hurricanes and in tornadoes. As a pastor, I have mobilized dozens of teams of volunteers to do relief work in Appalachia, in the Ozarks, in Ecuador, in Nicaragua. I've raised the money to build more than 300 homes for poor families. I have built medical clinics, feeding centers, and emergency shelters, and I've helped to provide food for tens of thousands of hungry people. But as Bishop Desmond Tutu said decades ago, there comes a point when we need to stop just pulling people out of the river. We need to go upstream and find out why they keep falling in. I am deeply grateful for the opportunities I've had to be a part of bringing relief to the chronically poor, the hungry, and the unhoused, to those who have been victims of floods, hurricanes, and tornadoes. But what sense does it make if we religious people keep trying to rescue people who've been victimized, 
generation after generation, century after century, if they're being victimized by moneyed interests who rig the system so that they can get richer by causing suffering to other people. In some ways, those of us who volunteer and who donate to charitable relief efforts are, in effect, empowering the moneyed interests to go on exploiting the vulnerable. I don't want to offer an apologetic for those who would like to avoid donating or volunteering. Trust me, I am currently, this week, involved in local efforts in the wake of these two hurricanes. But I know that it is not merely an accident of nature that kept me and my immediate neighbors safe while several people who live only a few miles away were killed and many are now homeless after losing absolutely everything in the hurricane. We must not stop pulling drowning people out of the river, but if we know that someone upstream is literally throwing more people into the rushing water, then aren't we obligated to also try to stop them? Climate change is not ethically neutral. There are winners and there are losers. There are forces of oppression and there are victims. This banner that I helped to design when we started our church in 2008 bears a quote from the Holocaust survivor and Nobel Prize winning author, Elie Wiesel. It says, thou shalt not stand idly by. In his reflections on the Holocaust, he concluded that such things are only possible when the majority of people refuse to take a moral stand. He explains that neutrality never serves the oppressed, but in fact, neutrality literally makes you a partner with the oppressor. My previous career of a as a pastor of a denominational church had made me sick of the moral relativism of most of mainstream religion always afraid of offending someone. Religion is reduced to helping the poor to carry their flood damaged furniture and appliances to the curb to be hauled away without ever trying to stem the causes of poverty and even of extreme weather. When a group of friends prevailed upon me to start a church for the genuinely progressive people of faith in my area, my primary insistence was that we could no longer try to constantly straddle the fence out of fear of giving offense. There would be no more standing idly by and remaining neutral in the face of injustice. That hasn't been an easy road to hoe for us. We gained some liberal members when I was critical of George W. Bush, but we also lost a lot of them when I was critical of Barack Obama. A church cannot remain morally relevant if it aligns itself to a political party. Every employment contract I've ever negotiated during my entire ministerial career has included a passage about guaranteeing me the freedom of the pulpit, but I found in every single instance that most board members stop believing in freedom of the pulpit if I ever said something that stepped on their toes. I'm going to have more to say about this in my next sermon, which will be posted on December 1st, when I talk about the power of the prophetic tradition and how it speaks truth to power. Thank you for watching our videos. We are entirely dependent on the donations of our listeners and members. We hope that you find this content to be important enough to help us to keep offering these videos to the public at no charge by becoming a regular contributor. Please click on the donate button on our website at www.spfccc.org. Thank you for your support of progressive religious programming.